Okay, guys, smoke them if you got them. Hmm. Well, so this is interesting. This module appears to activate this relay when it's energized and then after 10 seconds de-energize the relay so if I put this time duration knob down to the lowest setting which I assume is zero and I flip the switch I can hear this close immediately and then when I shut the switch off I hear it open immediately on off I put the knob up to I'll say about 10 I hit the switch nothing and then about 10 seconds later I hear a click So that would, that would be great if this was a, well, let's think about this. So what they must be doing is, because there's three connections on here, there is a common, well, there's five connections. Two connections are the AC input, 120 volts in. And then there is three connections that just go to the relay contacts. I looked on the other side of the board and I can clearly see they just go to the contacts. One is the common and one is marked NC for normally closed and one is marked NO for normally open. In other words, when the, when the relay is not energized, one contact makes and the other one is breaking. And then when the relay is energized, it goes the other way closes that other contact and opens the other one because you've literally got two contacts in here say the points of my fingers are the two contacts and you've got one moving piece inside the relay that the electromagnet is actually controlling and under spring tension it's touching one contact when the electromagnet's not energized when the electromagnet energizes it pulls that little arm down and causes it to break connection with this contact and make connection with this contact. Follow me? And then of course, if we remove the AC power to the module, then the spring, uh, the electromagnet loses its magnetic field and the spring will pull the contact, the little arm back up and make this contact again. So that's the basic principle of the relay. And the timing circuit, what it's doing is, it starts counting from the moment that the circuit is energized and waits the appropriate amount of seconds before it energizes the relay. So that's interesting. So they must be using the normally closed um, contact for the post flow. Wait a minute. I'm getting a headache thinking about this. Oh no, okay, I, I think I, I probably understand now how the circuit works. The way the circuit works is that when the contactor is closed, what's happening is there's no voltage present. There's no 120 volts present at those two points. So on the, on the current electromechanical one that's there, there's no voltage there when the contacts uh, when the contactor on the welder is closed and then when you uh, release the pedal for instance when you're welding and the contactor opens 120 volts gets applied to the clock motor in that electromechanical device and allows the timer to run down and then when the timer reaches its endpoint the uh, the contacts open and the solenoid opens. Let me say it closes. So by the same token, what's gonna happen in this situation is contactor on the welder opens, 120 volts is applied to this. The solenoid is being powered through 
the normally closed contacts after the allotted time in seconds the relay is energized and the normally closed contacts open and the solenoid shuts the gas sh solenoid shuts is that is that even right hey, you know what the easiest way to test this is to just hook it up and see what happens okay so let's review what's supposed to happen here with this electromechanical timer uh, the way this electromechanical timer works as we already figured out is that there's a spring-loaded clockwork uh, mechanism that when there is a solenoid that when it's energized actually allows the gear train to disengage and the spring to pop this little timer uh, this way clockwise until it hits this stop which is set with this lever here which basically regulates how far how many seconds up this timer is set to then when the uh, timing mo the timer motor is energized at that point what happens is the gear train rotates and this little clockwork mechanism counts down to zero. When it gets to zero, it activates a switch. That switch, when it's activated, actually has its normally closed contacts open up and de-energizes this solenoid and closes and shuts off the gas. And normally they would just have the water solenoid across the same connection. So we should be able to do the same exact thing with the, the other uh, module. Should be, a, be, be able to directly swap this out, I think. So let's just watch this work one more time before we uh, try this. I'm going to step on the pedal and close the contactor. Oh, I see. It counts down when it's de-energized. I don't hear that solenoid opening and closing at all. step on the contactor there's 120 volts present at these two connections and then as soon as I release the contactor the 120 volts goes away from here oh I see I made I made an assumption that these two go to the clock motor and that's what was kind of messing me up but I now see when I undid this that now this clock motor one goes to here and the other one goes to way over here which is one side of the leg for this so that's how they're doing it, Steve. All right, so I should be able to put that module in. It should be a direct substitute. And so I'm going to want to use the normally closed contacts on the relay to take the place of these two, uh, the switch that these two wires are going to. And then these two connections right here that go to the clock motor are going to be the AC to feed the uh, feed that circuit board. And we'll leave that control at eh, about the 10 second mark. I think it's working. It's hard to hear the solenoid over the sound of this huge fan. Look at the voltage going to the connections. Energized. I'm going to take my foot off the pedal. It stays energized. And 10 seconds later, it shuts off. Working perfect. All right. See if we can't break it.
So you're probably thinking, Steve, you just demonstrated that the thing works perfectly fine. Just put it in and be done with it. Well, I want to replace these two capacitors right here. And I want to clean this potentiometer. And that's all I'm going to do to this. Um, I was going to take this board out and clean it, but that's going to be pretty tough to do because they riveted this board into this metal frame. So I could drill the rivets out, but I don't really feel like going through that trouble. The solder connections all look actually pretty good, surprisingly enough. So I'm going to leave those well enough alone also. But these types of capacitors right here, they tend to go bad with age. So I think just for uh, a little bit of extra insurance. It's actually, oh, there's a third one there, a little one. Let's see how many are in the circuit completely. I see a small 8 pin IC chip, a diode, a couple of diodes, a couple of resistors, a relay large resistor, a disk capacitor, an old style transistor. This looks like a trim resistor right here that's been preset at the factory and then they uh, sealed it with some sort of sealant. So there's really only three electrolytic capacitors in the whole circuit here. It looks like there's two of these See, one is a 10 microfarad and the other one is a 100 microfarad. And this little itty bitty one right here, which we're going to have to clean up better to see what the value of that one is. And as long as that's not a non polarized one, then I should be able to, uh, I should have all of these. Oh, just a quick correction. These are both 100 microfarad at 35 volt. Um, and these types of capacitors right here, they, they're, they're what are called polarized capacitors, or they have a polarity to them, so they have a negative side. So this blue stripe right here with these dashes is to indicate that that's the, where the connection, negative connection would be. Okay, so there's two pins right there that come through the board and are soldered right there. And the one that is closest to me the one that the negative uh, connects to and I can see that the one on the uh, inside is facing the same way so that's those two pins there and again so the two pins that are closest to me are both negatives and they're both the same size so I can take both of those out at the same time and I don't have to worry about mixing them up because they're identical and then this one, like I said, I still can't quite see what the value of that one is. Probably going to have to take that one out to see what it is. It actually looks like there's even a minus sign on silk screened onto the PC board to indicate that that's the negative side of the capacitor. All right, that's a piece of cake. Hey everybody, it's Sunday, January 21st, 2018. And I'm back down here working on the timer module for the um, for the Airco TIG welder. And uh, I decided last time that I was going to replace the three electrolytic capacitors in here and clean the potentiometer. And that that was the only service I was going to do to this thing. And it doesn't need service. It's actually operating right now, but it's just as a precautionary me measure because I know as these electrolytic capacitors age, they tend to go bad. Um, I already cleaned the potentiometer. I used this um, uh, CAIG Laboratories KEG, I guess is how you say that, ProGold G5 Connector Enhancer, they call it. Um, this is good stuff for potentiometers based on what I found on the um, online. Um, it actually suggests that you pre-clean this with uh, deoxid power booster, but I've found pretty good success with just using this straight on scratchy volume controls in, in audio equipment. So anyways, so there's only three electrolytic capacitors in here. Unfortunately, I have a limited stock 
of new capacitors um, and that assortment right there does not have any 3.3 I think it was yeah, let's see. so what was in here was a, a 3.3 microfarad at 50 volt that little sucker and two 100 microfarad at 35 volt so I didn't have anything in this assortment so I decided to scavenge them from other equipment so you might ask well if you're just going to put used capacitors in why bother doing it at all or why not just order new capacitors well I don't want to wait um, for new capacitors to come in plus I'm going to pay more probably in the shipping than I am for the actual caps so why change them out at all well because if I scavenge them out of newer equipment and the um, capacitors are a decent manufacturer, then I, I'm going to end up with more than likely a better capacitor in there, more, more, more life left in it, so to speak. That, you know, and that's not always the rule of thumb. For instance, I wouldn't want to use any caps out of any like. Um, switching power supplies for PCs or especially anything on a motherboard on a PC. Although most of the caps on the motherboard on a PC are going to be low, lower voltage than 35 working volts unless they're right up in the power sections. And the problem with the caps on most of those motherboards is <clears throat> I, I have a suspicion that their liability is very minimal because if you think about it, typical motherboard when they manufacture it um, they're thinking that thing's going to be obsolete in a matter of years. So I don't know if that's why the caps on motherboards, in my experience, are so crappy or what. But you tend to see a lot of electrolytics on motherboards that the tops here will have a dome shape to them where they're popping out. And uh, that's oftentimes a premonition of failure. So I had a couple of TV chassis. Um, and although those TV chassis are pretty old, they're actually still newer than this PC board. This PC board was probably manufactured in the 70s by the looks of it. So it's interesting, I just want to show before I finish, I've already got two caps installed. I found a, um, actually I found the 3.3 microfarad in a uh, chassis. TV chassis and uh, I call that chassis boy that's really old school a PC board from a TV set a CRT TV set so give you an idea on the age but interestingly enough when I compare that capacitor to this original 3.3 they're both the same working voltage but when I compare the leakage on my leakage tester on my Sencor Z meter 2 this capacitor although it's still within the parameters, actually t tests a lot leakier than this one. Uh, and then the other thing I thought was interesting, this came out of uh, another PC board in a TV set that was even newer. This is a 100 microfarad 35 volt capacitor. This is the original 100 microfarad 35 volt capacitor. Same rating same working voltage same capacitance look at the size difference just goes to show you the advances in technology getting everything smaller okay so and these are by the by the way these are both the same brand these are both rubicon capacitors made by the same manufacturer i found another 100 mic so there's a 100 mic 35 that i had already put in before i found this one so you can see even that one's that one is like smaller than this one but larger than this one so that's an older cap than this one so if I had found this board because the board that I took this off of only had one cap it only had this one to spare um, so if I had found this board I probably would have put two of these in instead of that one and this one but I've already got that in there and uh, I deflux that so I'm going to put this one in and we'll retest this and be done with it. Hmm. Moron of the Week award goes to me. I just 
absent-mindedly reached over to grab the soldering iron because I was looking through the magnifying glass at the PC board. I reached over to grab the soldering iron and uh, reached over with my right hand and it jostled. So I tried to grab it from falling with my left hand and actually grab the barrel part right here. So it's probably a uh, probably a fingerprint on there, uh, skin print. Oh man, that hurt. All right, I'll soldier on. I'm just gonna bench test this before I put it back in the uh, welder. You can hear the relay closing almost immediately. As soon as I power it up, because I've got this knob set down low. Now I'm just gonna turn it up to about the what I believe is the 10 second mark. 1,001, 1,000. Yeah, it's like two seconds. Hmm. That's not a very uh, not a very accurate scale there. All right, so I'm going to simultaneously hit the uh, start button here on my stopwatch when I turn on the power. It was less than five seconds. I'll try and set it to the 30 second mark and see how it acts. Well, 26 seconds. So when I set it to 30, it's actually 26. That's not too bad. Problem is when I've set it to the really low settings down here, it's quite a bit different. So I got one of two choices. I could either try and figure out why that's happening more than likely there's some component in here that has changed value and is causing the problem um, I just don't have the the time nor the motivation to delve into this and find myself possibly chasing my tail because maybe it has maybe this is actually that not that I'm normal oh well I just did a little experiment found out something interesting um, no matter what position I put this in it's actually four seconds faster so if I put it in the uh, 10 second position it triggers in six seconds if I put it in the five second position it triggers in like one second if I put it in the 40 second position it triggers in like 36 seconds okay so it's not it, it would be more it would be a bigger problem if in each position that different changed but since it's a constant difference it's really just almost as if this knob is not aligned properly and quite frankly if I turn this knob all the way down it actually the, the pointer can actually go a little bit below this line and quite a bit above this line so I could actually I wonder if I could take this knob off if this knob, if, if the shaft of the potentiometer has splines, I might be able to put it one tooth over and correct my problem. Okay, I just took this knob off, it's a spline shaft, and I moved it counterclockwise one tooth on, the sh on its position on the shaft. And I've set this for 20 seconds. Let's see how I did. point two seconds and that point two seconds is probably just my delay in actually hitting the bu uh, the button with my finger not the most scientific test but I'll take it I like it now the reason why I'm glad that that worked is because alternatively this little potentiometer right here that I'd spotted way back when which is marked as R53 I happen to notice if I look at this judging from where it is in the circuit I bet you that's a trimmer to calibrate this exactly problem is they do it at the factory and then they uh, seal it with some kind of goop and if I try and shave this goop off so that I can change that adjustment I may end up actually damaging it I really don't want to risk that um, plus the fact that I just move it over one 
tooth and it works perfect makes me wonder whether or not if it's just a case that somebody had this knob off at some point and put it back on wrong I'll do one more check uh, do a check at 30 seconds and maybe a check at 10 seconds and see how it acts and then I'll wrap it up yep it's working perfect now so I don't have to worry about <clears throat> having to compensate for a miss miss uh, represented number on here this will actually be when I set this to 20 it will actually be 20 seconds of post flow okay the slow bolt from China came in and uh, this is the nylon sock for lack of a better term or nylon sheath that I uh, purchased from uh, off of eBay off of a Chinese supplier so it takes longer to get that way but it was dirt dirt cheap and this came from I'm not even going to try and pronounce. I'm going to try and pronounce it. But this is all this is. And if you go to a welding supply house and buy one of these, you're going to pay quite a bit more money for it. And I think what... My theory on these is that this is actually leftover waste material from some other manufacturing process of making something else. And that... The uh, Chinese just figured out that if they take the little narrow strips and uh, fold them in half and sew them, I think these are sewn. Yeah, right on the edge there. Actually, looks like it might be sewn on both edges. I don't know. But anyways, the reason why I think that is because they sell this version, this nylon one here, and then there's another one that looks just like um, denim material left over from like making jeans or something so I'm gonna wrestle this mess onto my uh, my three uh, three lines going to my TIG torch so snaking these uh, snaking these cables through this sheathing is tricky because because of the large nut that's on the water return line slash uh, power cable that won't fit through here so you gotta disconnect the End of the, the end of that cable that's at the torch head, which has a little quarter inch fitting on it, and then uh, feed that through here, which I did. You can't feed all of them up through at the same time because these have to go through from the torch end, so they go in the opposite direction. You have to feed these cables, the uh, supply, um, water supply, and the gas lines have to be fed through this sheathing in the opposite direction. So I had to undo all my tape that I had on here holding these together, which that's no biggie. Um, but now I got to get these to go through the other direction. What happens is when you want to push this in, this this nut just wants to keep pushing back. So just as a little tip for somebody who's doing this, in case they haven't figured out on their own. I'm just going to use some electrical tape and I'm going to tape this up into a little uh, a little bullet. This will do a couple of things. It'll um, it'll act to keep this nut captive but it'll also make this a little smoother on the outside. Not that that not that those threads make that much of a uh, difference. Oh, I finally got these. <laughs> I finally got all of these lines into this protective sleeve, but boy, it was a real pain in the butt. Um, if I had to do it over again, or if anybody's going to do this and they happen to come across this video before they do it, uh, let me give you a tip. Um, you obviously, because of the size of the nut on this one, this line has to go in from the opposite, the torch end, whereas the other two lines, because of the way they are, uh, because they're attached to the torch, I fed them in from the torch end. But when I was trying to feed this uh, one of these two lines, I, I had this line in and one of these lines in, and when I tried to put the other line in, it got all jammed up. Even though I was using, which this is something I should have used right from the beginning, this nice big snake that I have for electrical work so uh it's, you know let's get this stiff wire so i could push this wire through one end then i used electrical tape to hook the uh the uh cable up to this and pull it back through so that being said what i discovered was 
in the end, it got jammed in there so badly that I had to pull this one all the way back out to free it up. And then I was able to get this one in. So then I had both of these in. Then I did this back the other way with the snake and it was a lot easier because this is so much smaller than this. So my recommendation is you A, use an electrical snake like fish tape like this um, and B, you put this one in last. Okay, here's the current holdup and the next pain in the butt. Uh, this is the original electromechanical module that went in here like so, okay? And I just went to mount the solid state module, the upgraded module in, and if I mount it right where the current screws are, what happens is the bottom edge of the PC board actually will be overlapping this. So first, I actually, this is all bent up because I took some pliers and I rudely <laughs> bent this out so that I could get this PC board to sit behind this, okay? And then I thought, okay, that'll solve my problem because this way the foil runs on the back of the PC board right here. These contact points won't be able to short out against this. The problem is, I realized as soon as I did it, I still get a problem because when I put when I put the uh, spade connectors here onto these connections here, they're going to short out against the case here. So I've got a couple of different things I can do to fix this problem. I could notch out this part right here of the case. Um, the problem with that is that this piece of metal right here that I've been torquing and bending on, this is actually part of the whole frame here. So this this metal right here is a bend 90 degrees off of this metal frame. This is all f stamped out or formed in one big press. So I can't really take this off to do any kind of uh, modifications to it. So I'd have to use a burr or a grinder or something and try and cut this open and it would look even worse than me bending this up. Um, I could re-drill holes, these little mounting holes, um, and move this module up on this plate. The problem with that is then I start running into hitting the underside of this terminal block. So you can see I don't have a lot of room there to begin with. I even bent these out a little bit to give me a little bit more room and it's still not going to really be a good idea to do that. If I want to move the terminal block up, I'd have to re-drill holes for the terminal block and move that up even higher and it would be on the edge here. So I don't like that idea either. But then I noticed that this whole plate right here that has the solenoid mounts on it and everything and the terminal block attached to it, this whole plate is held. This is a separate piece of metal that's held to the frame by four screws. So I think I can take this out and elongate the holes. So the only thing I'm worried about is this resistor right here. If I move this up too far, I'll hit the back, I'll hit the edge at the side of this resistor. So I've got a, well, I could stick my finger in there. So I should be able to easily move this up a quarter of an inch move this whole plate up a quarter of an inch and I think that's going to give me just enough room to clear this so that's the plan okay everybody I finished my work over here uh, I ended up drilling new hole locations in the frame here this orange part uh, for these screws and by doing that I was able to raise this entire assembly up. Uh, you can actually see the little dirt mark right there, a little shadow line from about there to where it is now. That gives me ample clearance for the bottom edge of this PC board on the solid state switch. Alright, so 
that takes care of that problem there. I ran my wires down behind this metal plate right here to the bottom connections. As we discussed earlier, I have omitted the water solenoid so that as long as the pump is running, I constantly have flow going to the torch, uh, water flow. My gas solenoid I'm still using because I don't want to waste gas. I've got my connections to the uh, from the torch to the uh, power block and to the gas. However, because I am not hooking this up to the water solenoid and in fact want this to go all the way up to the cooler, uh, the output on the cooler, this is now too short. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut back along this nylon right here far enough so that enough of this hose is out and can reach up to the top there. And then I'll just zip tie the, uh, the area in a couple of spots along the area where the cut is in the nylon. So most of my torch cables will still be protected and held together by the nylon. In addition to redrilling the holes, I ground out an area of metal right here. And that's because I was worried about how close the proximity of the top edge of this metal was to this bottom of this component here, which is a large wire wound resistor. So I did not want that to be sh having the potential to be shorted out against this case. So all I've got left to do is, like I said, I've got to cut this sheathing back, get the uh, water line hooked up, reestablish my flow, and then I can test fire this thing. Okay, I topped off the uh, coolant level uh, a little bit in the uh, cooler because when I had taken all the lines and disconnected them, I lost quite a bit of fluid. So, in retrospect, I wish I hadn't put my new expensive coolant in there before I ended up fixing all these lines. Uh, speaking of fixing the lines, this stuff is so tough to cut that what I did was I just sliced a hole in it right here and then pulled that one line that's going to go right up to the water cooler back out and up to the cooler so I don't have to worry about tying these together with ties like I thought I was going to have to do because I thought I was going to slit the whole length of that but it, it was actually so difficult to cut so anyways so I'm ready for my first dry run first test I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that the solenoid, the gas solenoid is uh, opening and closing when it's supposed to. So the way I'm going to tell that is I'm going to open up my uh, valve on my tank and uh, set the flow meter and I should see the little ball on the flow meter go up when that solenoid valve opens. So I definitely got the valve is open, I got pressure here, I've got no flow. I'm going to open this flow valve. Still no flow because the solenoid is closed. Now I'm going to fire up the welder and when I step on the uh, pedal, contactor should close and I should get flow. And then when I release the pedal and the contactor opens, flow should continue for the post flow period. I've got my torch draped over my foldable welding table, not in contact with any metal, so I should be safe from drawing any arcs. I've also got the high frequency off for the moment. That was weird, when I turned the welder on, I heard gas flow, but it stopped. The ball's not moving. All right, let's see what happens when I step on the uh, pedal. There we go. So I'm sending the flow right now to 20. The ball's at 20. It's right there. I can hear the gas flowing. Now I'm going to open the contactor. And we're still flowing. 
and there we go. I heard a little click and it shut off. So my post flow uh, is working. So that's great. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check and make sure my high frequency is still working. I guess I can shut this off for now. Now I'm gonna throw the switch to turn the high frequency start on and uh, I'm gonna shut off this light behind me and when I step on the pedal, the high frequency should engage and we'll know it's working if we see sparks going like crazy over here and it should be kind of loud. All right, here it goes. Ooh, this is getting exciting.